Uh, so thanks everyone for coming out um, and skipping the Giants sports ball match thing that's happening. Um, I'm going to try to keep this fairly short, uh, and uh, I want, if there are any questions during the presentation, feel free to jump in. Uh, this is going to be kind of walking a line between fairly deep concepts, but trying to keep it shallow enough that it's uh, still accessible and consumable. Um, but the main motivation behind this uh, talk is if you go to meetups like this, there's often um, very interesting and compelling presentations on functional programming or category theory or uh, monads and, and all these kind of exciting and, and sexy topics. Uh, but they're, they're very frequently uh, sort of sandboxed to like a very academic um, environment or, or academic application. And it's, uh, by that I mean it's sort of hard to take these ideas and connect them with code that you actually write during the day for money. Um, so I want to try to con bridge those two worlds a little bit uh, and use an example uh, from some code that I actually write at work uh, at, at Versal where I work uh, and um, hopefully show you how you can do some of the same kind of things. Uh, so the, the scope of this is uh, functional programming, um, which I'll define in a second. Um, promises these things like safety and composability and reusability and lots of fun buzzwords. Um, and we're going to connect that with actual code that can do real things. Um, and by the way, this is an adaptation of another talk I did uh, where all the code was written in JavaScript. And this is a Scala port of that talk. So I highly recommend uh, the Scala version of this over the JavaScript version. Um, as we'll see, types tend to help out. OK, so I have a couple of asterisks uh, on the previous slide. Um, functional programming and real world. So for the purposes of this presentation, um, when I say functional programming, um, I basically mean referential transparency. Um, how many of you are familiar with referential transparency? OK, cool. So most of you. Uh, in a nutshell, it means that uh, if your code is referentially transparent or if, if an expression is referentially transparent, uh, your code is identical whether you replace that expression with the result of evaluating that expression or with the expression itself. So uh, if you say val a equals 1 plus 2, uh, then anywhere in your code that a appears, you could replace with 1 plus 2 or vice versa, and the code would not change in meaning. Uh, and, and where this uh, starts to be useful is if you had val a equals println hello world 1 plus 2, uh, then that goes away because uh, referencing a, uh, well, I guess if it were a function, referencing A has this side effect where we're printing to the screen and then returning the result of 1 plus 2. And that's, of course, not equivalent to just saying 1 plus 2. Uh, so we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. And then when I say real world, uh, I, I couldn't actually take code from our production environment and put it into slide form and have it be readable. So this is a, an analogous example that I hope is still uh, real world-esque. So our Example, a uh, real world sort of like um, problem is an ATM. Um, and so we're going to write some code for uh, operating an ATM uh, that will let a user do things like check their balance and deposit money and withdraw money and so forth. Um, and yeah, ATM examples are kind of common and maybe a little bit boring, um, but they're useful, especially in this case, because we're talking about functional programming and we're talking about state uh, and handling state in a consistent and predictable way, which is a little important when you're talking about money. Uh, and then a, a quick uh, aside. Uh, so for, again, since this is kind of a simplistic example, uh, when we talk about a bank account in this example, we're really just talking about a list of um, transactions that have happened. Uh, so my bank account is the list of all the deposits and withdrawals that I've ever made. Uh, and so the type of an account will be a list of floats um, and of uh, individual contribution or deduction from the account is a single float. Um, so where are we coming from? What's the, the inspiration for this? Uh, this is sort of the non-functional way uh, that we might write a, uh, something like a deposit function. So off somewhere in some global context we have uh, an account and it's this globally accessible uh, reference to a list of floats. And in this case, I've made it a var so that we can change it. And when we call the deposit function, we say, I want to deposit $20. Uh, and so the first thing we do is grab that account and update it. 
So we add, uh, we append a, a transaction. Uh, and then from the function, we return the, the balance of the account by just summing up the, those list of floats. Uh, and so it seems nice and straightforward, but it actually has a lot of problems. Um, so we've got a lot of mutability in here. We have this account reference, which is a variable reference, or a mutable reference. Um, and so basically anyone can come along and set account equal to a new list of floats or, uh, um, well, that's basically it. They can, uh, they can change uh, the assignment of account and you won't know that that happened necessarily. Uh, we also have this kind of imperative looking deposit function. So when you, when you reference the deposit function uh, and, and you um, apply it with uh, an X in this case, it will actually execute this code. So when you say deposit of 20, uh, we will run account equals account append X, and then we will run account.sum. Uh, so the code kind of happens as soon as you touch it. Um, and then finally, it's kind of inconsistent. Uh, it might not look at like it at first, but there are actually, what, three references to account um, in this function. We're, we're looking up the account, we're assigning it, and then we're looking it up again. Uh, and as you know, in kind of a multi-threaded environment, there could be many people referencing the same uh, data structure. And so when I look it up the first time, it might be one thing, and then when I append to it and reassign it, it might have changed uh, in the meantime by someone else. And then finally, when I look it up again and take the sum, it might have changed again behind the scenes. And so we really have no idea what uh, the consistency of this uh, data structure is. Um, and so here's how we can take uh, state as a side effect, which we had in the previous slide, and convert it into more of a computational effect. Uh, so this is basically, um, philosophically, this is doing the exact same thing, uh, except we're now representing our deposit function as this sort of callback looking thing. So when I call deposit of 20, rather than doing anything, so we actually, oops, we actually are not touching account, we're not modifying account, nothing really happens other than we construct this function and return it. And so this is a function that once provided an account knows how to calculate this, the balance and knows how to create a new account uh, that's the result of appending a new transaction to it. So we've gotten rid of the mutability. Uh, when we eventually do run this function uh, that's on the second line, the, that account reference is fixed. Uh, so on the, left, on the right side of that arrow, we say account.sum and account uh, append x that's the same account reference, and there's no way it can change behind the scenes, uh, assuming it's an immutable list. We also have, as I uh, kind of alluded to, we have this sort of declarative structure uh, where a, instead of uh, like on the previous slide where when we call deposit, we're actually running our, our business logic. In this case, when we call deposit, we just return a function that we can hang on to and, and run at a later time once we know what the account is. Um, and then finally, it's consistent. Uh, so within the body of this function, uh, we are certain that the account uh, reference is the same uh, for every access. Uh, so what I want to do is come up with a way to represent these kind of stateful uh, actions. And, and then we'll add in some, um, some nice uh, functions that we can use to compose these things together. But let's start simple. So let's create a case class called state. And state just wraps this function run. Uh, run is a generic function that provided some external state will do some kind of computation and it will return a tuple that uh, contains some arbitrary value and then a potentially new state. So in our previous slide, uh, you can see that uh, our function takes an account, which is that list of floats, and then it returns a tuple of the balance of the account and a new account, which is account with one transaction appended. So just generalizing that a little bit, uh, that would be this run function where S is a list of floats and A is a float. Uh, so now we have this case class and we can uh, stick a sort of a state action function inside of it. Uh, now that we have it, uh, we can start to compose it with different things. So let's say we have, uh, well before I get into an example, uh, we want to uh, come up with a way to take our state action, uh, which was deposited in, in an earlier slide, and potentially do something with the output of that function. So let's say uh, our run function returns as tuple as, and we have another function that can convert the a into something. 
Um, but this function f is called pure because it doesn't really care about the state coming into or going out of uh, our run function. It doesn't care about the account, essentially. All it really knows how to do is manipulate the, in this case, the balance uh, in some way. So all we really need to do is uh, compose run and then this uh, little case um, partial function where uh, we, we run um, our state action and then we take the output of that, which is this AS tuple, uh, and then we apply F to the A uh, and that gives us a B uh, and then re we return the same S because it hasn't been changed at all. And so an example of this would be uh, if we have, oh, and, and for simplicity, um, we're going to call a transaction. Uh, this is just a type alias, so it, uh, saying TX or state of list float are identical. But for cleanliness, we'll say that a transaction of type A is a state where the input is this list of floats, it's the account, uh, and the output is some arbitrary A. Uh, and so an example of that is called balance. So balance is a value, which is a function. Uh, wrapped up in a state. Uh, and so balance says, uh, I'm a function that when given an account, I know how to compute the balance of the account, which is this account.sum. Uh, and then I'll also pass back the account unmodified. And then uh, if we have a pure function that knows how to take a balance, which is a float, and convert it into some readable string like your balance is such and such, uh, we can apply that function to the balance without touching the state by using map like this. Uh, so we have uh, report, which is itself a state function wrapped up in a state case class. Uh, that's the result of calling map on this balance uh, state class <laughs> uh, and then applying this pure function to it. Okay. <clears throat> so that's composition with a pure function, uh, which we use map for. When we want to compose with uh, another state action, uh, we have to use flat map. And so the, the difference in type signatures between map and flat map uh, is subtle. Uh, map takes a function from A to B and returns a new state. Flat map takes a function from A to a new state and returns a new state. Uh, and so in this case, uh, our function f is actually potentially performing some computation that depends on the state and maybe returns a new state. Um, but our composition looks almost the same. So we will run our embedded state function and we'll get an A and a, a, an S out of that. Um, and then now we have our A so we can run F to get our new state, uh, ac uh, our, our new state instance um, from, the, uh, from uh, the input of A. Um, and then once we have uh, our state of SB, uh, we can't just return it because we would have a state of a state which um, is a little bit too nested. So on the state that's returned, oh, I've got a laser. On the state that's returned by the evaluation of this function, which is this state here, uh, we call its run function. So, so this state has its own run, which will be s to bs. Um, and so we apply that function with the same state uh, that came out of running this uh, function. So an example of that, um, it's a little bit more code, but I think we can get through it. Uh, so first let's uh, create a state. Um, so we'll call this one deduct. So when I call deduct and give it some, um, some value, it will return a transaction. Remember a transaction in this case is just a state of list of float and A, where in this case our A is float. So this says that it will be a state action that when provided an account will return a float and then a new account. Uh, so inside of our state action, we take the account, and if the account has sufficient funds, um, that is, if the, the sum of the account is uh, at least as much as we want to uh, deduct from the account, uh, then we go ahead and do so. We return a tuple containing uh, the amount deducted. Uh, I think I might have said balance earlier. Anyway, we return the amount deducted, uh, and then we uh, create a new account representation where we've appended the deduction uh, to the account. Um, otherwise, there are insufficient funds to make this deduction, so we return a tuple that says nothing was withdrawn or nothing was deducted from the account, uh, and then pass the account straight through because it hasn't changed. Um, so this is a, this is a single uh, state um, or transaction. So now we're going to take that and we're going to flat map it with something. So let's say we want to be able to deduct but then also charge a fee. You know, you go to a foreign ATM or something and it charges you three bucks to get your own money. 
so in that case, if we call deduct with fee, we pass it the amount that we want to withdraw. So maybe deduct with fee of 20 bucks. Uh, and then the first thing we do is we call deduct of x. So we're getting this state here with the argument passed in. So this, is, this will either deduct nothing or it will deduct uh, $20 and then return the new uh, account with the new transaction. Um, so from that, we've got a state. And now we can call flat map. And flat map will take uh, an argument, which is in this case, either this zero or this amount deducted. Um, and with that, we'll create a new state. So this is a function from float to state. Uh, so we'll create a new state that, given an account, and in this, so it's uh, maybe a little bit tricky, but this account here will actually be what's returned from this state action. So either this guy or this one. Um, so this state, given the potentially modified account, will create a fee, and then it will return a new tuple where we're adding the amount deducted and the fee. So it will be the total amount uh, deducted from the account. And then we're also appending a new, um, uh, a new transaction to the account. So when we run this whole thing, or, or if we were to run deduct with fee with uh, a value and then provide it with an account, it would possibly deduct the amount that we want to deduct if there's enough funds. And then it will um, charge a fee. And so what will come out of here is our original account, potentially uh, with this minus x appended, uh, and then with another minus fee appended. So actually, it occurs to me that this one is kind of a bummer because we're always deducting a fee even if we didn't uh, deduct any money, but uh, maybe it's a, it's a bad bank, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so this could, this could give you an account with negative $3, uh, which would then maybe charge you for insufficient funds or something. James? Yes? Uh, I think actually Vlad was going to ask before, but if you start asking, so in, in here, uh, each time we're actually creating a new account in, in memory. Mm -hmm. But in a real situation, we actually want to have really one and only single account. Right. Uh, that to me seems to conflict the original intention. How do you? Right. So the question is, where is this account coming from? And how are we making sure that it's, we're not just creating new accounts all over the place? Um, which would not really reflect reality because you only have one account um, per person. Um, and actually, nowhere in this code yet have we created a new account. So all we've done so far is build up a bunch of functions who have this type where S is the initial account to provide. Uh, I thought you specifically in the example before when you uh, here, the account that you return is mm -hmm. the account plus the minus S. Right. That is a new account. That is a new account. Yeah. Well, that's a new instance of a list that, that has a... That's the account. Sure. So uh, I, is your question about what do we do now that there is one account reference here and another one here? I'm trying to point out that um, using that state format, we are actually having multiple instances of accounts mm -hmm. in, in, arriving around the place sure. where the semantics of what we wanted to originally to do, assuming a real uh, application, was to have one and only one account mm -hmm. that is uh, continually being updated and uh, not at each time you know, there's different deductions or balances in the multiple instances. So, Right, it's a good point, and we'll, we'll actually get there um, in a few slides. Um, but So basically the concern is uh, we have one account instance here, this creates a new one, this doesn't, uh, but this also creates a new one. So we have potentially three lists that are considered accounts, and does that create a problem? Um, and it, it could potentially be problematic if we don't um, have good semantics around controlling access to the single, the real account. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a few slides. Okay, so now that we've built our state case class and we've written map and flat map, we basically have what's called the state monad. Uh, and so it looks like this. Uh, but this is unchanged from the, the previous slides. So what can we do with this thing? Uh, well, I want to come back to some of the claims I made at the beginning. 
uh, that functional programming is safe and composable and reusable. Uh, and so let's look at how state uh, gets us that. Uh, so for safety, uh, here's a, another example of a transaction, uh, an instance of the state monad. Uh, if we write a function called contribute, which is kind of the opposite of deduct, uh, it takes an argument that's the amount to contribute to the account, and it returns a new state action that when run with an account, uh, returns that nothing was withdrawn from the account or nothing was deducted, and the new account is, has been appended with this new uh, transaction. Um, and so we've, we've solved some of the issues that we saw earlier where we have no mutable references. Uh, there are no vars in here, nothing, no, no references to our values can change. Uh, we're not using any mutable data structures, so our, well, I, I'm asserting that we would only use a, an immutable list uh, in, in this example, which means that we can never call account.append uh, to modify the account in place. Um, this function necessarily returns a new list, uh, which you, you pointed out. Uh, so our state actions are, uh, I say necessarily atomic, meaning uh, you can't, you can't, uh, you can either apply this function or not. Um, there's kind of no in between. So uh, when you apply the function, you, you tell it, here's the current account, run the function, and the output of that is the new account, the new um, canonical account. Uh, and, and there's no kind of middle ground. Um, and then finally, uh, we won't get too much into this, but these things can optionally be transactional, uh, but that then gets into uh, the way we run these things is with an interpreter, which we'll see uh, in a few slides. Why yeah. Are you using units oh, so for the purposes of this thing, I'm, uh, I want this tuple to indicate the amount um, deducted from the account. Um, so I guess I could have put zero there. Uh, in this case, the, the reason it's unit is mostly because there's not any useful information that we care to provide. Uh, so when you call contribute, it's sort of like, it's sort of like calling a, a set method uh, on a Java class, you know, set x to one. The output of that is, is usually void. Like you don't really care. There's, there's no useful information coming out of that. Uh, we could put maybe a confirmation in here, true, it worked, or put a number saying $0 were, were deducted or X dollars were contributed. Uh, it, it really depends on the use case. Um, but in this case, we don't really care about uh, uh, what happened because it's so simple. Okay, and, and so these are composable as well. Um, we, in a few slides ago, we wrote uh, deduct and contribute. Uh, did we also write balance? Yes, we did. Um, and so contribute, uh, which we saw in the, just in the previous slide, had the type transaction of unit. Um, balance had the type transaction of float. So when we call balance, we get a state that computes the, the sum of the account and returns that. Um, and to put these things together, all we have to do is stick them in a for comprehension. And the reason we can do this is because we wrote map and flat map on our state case class. So when I call contribute of x, what comes back is a state of list of float and unit. And when I put this little arrow here, Scala will desugar that into this thing dot flat map, and then a function that takes an argument that we don't care about and passes it to uh, evaluate balance. Um, and then again, balance returns a state, uh, which we flat map and take B, and then we will just map that into uh, a result. Actually, this will be a, a map, not a flat map. Uh, so our, our total uh, uh, function here, deposit, um, is this nice composition of contribute and balance. We say, hey, I want to deposit x. First thing we do is contribute x to the account. Um, and the next thing we do is get the balance. And then we yield that $0 were deducted and b is our balance. And the reason this works, uh, and kind of, I think, this is what I find so cool about this code is that we have this implicit account being passed through all these functions, but you don't see it anywhere in here. So we don't ever have to say account.append this amount uh, and then call balance and pass it the account and, and you know, get the new account out of it. Like all of that is nicely abstracted from us by map and flat map uh, in our state uh, monad. Uh, and then similarly, we can, we can write a withdraw function that does kind of the same thing. Uh, it calls deduct, which is a state uh, case class instance, um, takes, the, uh, takes that, that first 
tuple argument, uh, which will be the amount deducted. Uh, and then we call balance to check the balance of our new account that comes out of evaluating this thing. Um, and then we just return the uh, amount withdrawn and then the new balance. Uh, so the, the, the point of this is that we can make these more complicated or, or larger uh, state instances uh, by building them up from smaller ones. And it's, it's handy because uh, it, this looks imperative, right? It looks like we're calling deduct and we're calling balance. But actually, just like before, all of this code is just returning a new instance of state. So it's kind of this deferred action or this callback. Uh, it's just returning a thing that, when you give it an account, will run all this stuff and then tell you what the new account is. So there's kind of no side effects. It's not like we had print lins in here that uh, kind of do stuff on the side and, and we don't really realize that's happening. When we call withdraw, no accounts are changed, nothing really happens. We're just sort of ready to go. Oh, and then finally reusability, which is basically uh, in this case the same as uh, composition. Um, we can take deposit and withdraw, which we wrote in the previous slide, and then put them together. Um, and so we can keep we can build up this big library of all these different state actions uh, and put them together in different ways for different use cases, and it all kind of fits together very nicely. Okay, so how do we make this thing go? Uh, when we have a state action, uh, we have one of these transactions, the only way to, to make it run is to provide it with an account. And when we give it an account, it gives us back some value plus the new account. Um, so let's write a, an interpreter uh, called run. So run says, hey, if, if you give me uh, one of these state actions, um, I will run it for you and then give you back the thing that it returns plus the new account. And it does that by taking x, with, which is our state action. x is an instance of state. Uh, of state. Uh, and state has a run uh, argument. Remember, state is just a case class with a run function. Uh, so we call run and we apply account, which is this list of floats. Um, and then the output of that is kind of hard to read, but it's, uh, here's our A, and then here's our S. So A is this tuple with the amount withdrawn and the new balance, and then S, which in this case is A, <laughs> is the new account. Um, so we run with our existing account. We get a bunch of data out, including the new account. We update this reference, uh, so we're setting account is now the, the updated account with all the new transactions uh, appended to it. And then finally we return this data, so we return the amount withdrawn, the new balance, plus the new uh, account list, which is um, fitting this structure here. So where did this actually get us? Because I see a var there, and I thought the whole point of this was to get rid of vars. Um, so yeah, there, there are problems with this. Uh, if we're writing our code like this, we have a var, which means we're not thread safe. Anyone can come along and modify this thing. Uh, we could potentially have two state actions running in parallel, and they're both trying to reassign account, which is a problem. Um, and uh, we also, there's nothing in here about transactions. So what if uh, our, our transaction state instance was something that had many steps, like get the balance, contribute some, some funds, compute the balance again, uh, withdraw some funds, whatever. And during one of those steps, there's some database error, like we lost the connection. Uh, then now we're not in a consistent state, like we've committed some things to the database and not others. So uh, this does nothing for uh, transaction management. Um, but it's actually not as big a problem as it might seem. So what we've done here is basically this represents the, the far edge of our program. Uh, so this is like our maiden method or our servlet or you know, whatever uh, tooling or framework you're using. This is like the outer edge that finally makes our state, uh, our state action that represents our program to run, uh, run. And so synchronizing access to a var, if that's the pattern we want to use, is maybe not so bad. Uh, or um, if we're using a database, uh, like a relational database and not a, this var um, to track accounts, uh, we would then figure out how do we want to do transaction management in that environment. Um, but for the purposes of this slideshow, it's, we can't really cover all of those uh, possibilities. Uh, but I will say that uh, in practice, uh, we, uh, at my company, we use this pattern, and it actually works pretty well. Uh, we, we represent all state-changing actions as this uh, serialized queue of things to, to run. 
Um, and so that way we can synchronize access, we can synchronize updates to this uh, data model. Um, and then because our data is immutable, so account is, the, the reference is mutable, but the data itself is immutable because we're using an immutable list. Uh, we don't have to worry about people who are just getting information about the account um, to access that, that uh, variable. Um, so it's only these sort of state changing events that we're concerned about and that we have to synchronize access to. And it, it turns out uh, that it works pretty well. Uh, and then I have a little demo. I don't think it's gonna be that interesting without a keyboard um, since I can't click on anything with this. <laughs> uh, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, are there any questions? I kind of ran through that really fast. So, uh, yeah, I have your company is the event like the accounts, or do you have some other application of this? Yeah, so unfortunately, I had to really sort of simplify this example, but this, the pattern is exactly what we're doing uh, at my company. We have all of our uh, business logic is represented as uh, instances of these state monads, um, and we just combine them in different ways to build the different, uh, so like, if you want, my company builds an education platform, so there might be an, an action that re represents um, modification of a course, and that might have many steps, like looking up who the author of the course is and making sure, you're doing some authorization to make sure that's you, uh, and then looking up the data of the course, taking the data that you've provided and doing some kind of update and then persisting that back to the database. All of that is composed from these little, you know, smaller actions uh, to build up a bigger and bigger state instance. Uh, and then once that thing is kind of ready to go, we, uh, if there are updates required, we stick it in a queue and it runs kind of in order. Um, if there are not updates required, if it's just something like, uh, you know, looking up some metadata or something, we'll run it right away with whatever the, whoops, with whatever the current state of the world is. Um, but yeah, it, it's so it, we don't have, uh, we're not building an ATM, but it's basically the same thing. We have this data model that represents the current state of the world, all of the, in our case, it's all of the courses and all of the users and all of the organizations and kind of other data that we have. Uh, and we update that using uh, this pattern and we read from it uh, directly. In your real world implementation or utilization of this, how did you deal with errors and validations? Did you bury that in the uh, state and let it, and then it's inspect that when you need to? Yeah, that's a very good question. So how do we deal with errors? Uh, like I said, there could be a problem in one of these little buried uh, state actions and we wouldn't really know about it. And that's another reason why I had to simplify this for the purposes of uh, presenting. We're using, uh, we're using state uh, but it's, rather than being a state that returns this tuple of float, uh, it's actually returning uh, an either type, which is either the failure or the successful value. Um, and our state actually isn't a state, it's a state T, which is a monad transformer, but uh, basically it's a state of another monad, which is either. Um, and so all, when we write, when we write our primitives, uh, things like this, or even more primitive, things like this. Uh, when, we're, when we're doing this update step, that's where we're likely to get an error, especially if it's a database insert or any kind of um, database interaction. Um, so this function, we'll, we'll go ahead and try to do this, and then if there's an error, the thing we return will not be just this unit, it would be a left of the actual error. Um, otherwise, it would be the right of the success. And then by putting them together, uh, as soon as we encounter a left, which is, captures the error, we basically stop, and that's the thing that gets returned. And so, um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I, I'm just curious whether in your implementation did you draw upon any of Scala Z or just write it off as a scratch? We're using Scala Z a lot, yeah. So are yeah, you we, in fact using either instead of, instead of validation, or? Uh, we, we're using, we started with our own either implementation um, and we quickly found that it was, uh, that Scala Z already had way more uh, than we really wanted to write. So yeah, we've, we've converted to the, I think we're using their disjunction, not their validation, but it gives us the se semantics that we need. All right, thanks, James. Oh, sorry, Mike. If you have